Coming up on Arirang News, the South Korean government announces some $60 billion worth of investment into the services industry using Korea's strengths in technology. A large portion of that will go to R&D. Data show Korea's consumer inflation stubbornly low again in May, still far below the target of 2%. Demand is still weak and the government expects things to continue this way for a while. And U.S. President Donald Trump says he thinks he will eventually have another meeting with North Korea's Kim Jong-un. They've been exchanging letters and Trump noted that North Korea has not been testing nuclear weapons. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on our afternoon newscast. I'm Devin Whiting. The U.S. has made clear that when he comes to South Korea later this week, President Trump has no plans to meet with North Korea's Kim Jong-un. But there still seems to be hope that a summit will take place at some point. Our E.G. Wan has our top story. Along with the renewed anticipation of North Korea and the U.S. resuming their denuclearization talks, comes hope for a third Pyongyang-Washington summit. And President Trump's comments to reporters at the Oval Office on Tuesday fueled speculation it might happen sooner rather than later. Just a nice letter back and forth. He wrote me a beautiful letter on birthday. It was my birthday. As you know, last week he wrote me a beautiful letter. I thought it was very nice. And just two friendly letters. We get along very well. No and, mention of another meeting? Uh, maybe there was, but we, uh, you know, at some point we'll do that. Getting along very well. He's not doing nuclear testing. Unlike in the past, a top-down approach is being pursued in a bid to solve the denuclearization issue. And on June 12 last year, the leaders of the longtime foes finally met for their first sit-down in Singapore. There, they agreed on the four pillars of establishing their ties and achieving denuclearization. On top of the hard talks, the two leaders also engaged in various activities that allowed them to get to know each other on a personal level, including a one-on-one -on -one sit down just with their translators and a leisurely stroll. But things did not go so smoothly after that as the two sides faced a critical issue of who does what first and in exchange for what. Despite a number of working level talks after Singapore, their negotiations hit a wall. And the two leaders stepped in, meeting again about eight months later, this time in Hanoi. Both leaders seem to have thought they could persuade their counterpart into taking the next step in implementing their deal. But neither side budged. Kim was firm on the U.S. lifting sanctions on the North's economy in exchange for the dismantling of the regime's Yongbyon nuclear facility. Trump said Yongbyon had to be dismantled and the North had to provide an overall and detailed roadmap for denuclearization. Since then, no significant talks have been held, at least not publicly. Whether this week's series of summits between Presidents Moon Jae-in, Trump and Xi Jinping can revive the momentum for dialogue remains to be seen. But there are concerns that working-level talks need to first pave the way in order to prevent the same mistakes made in Hanoi. Lee ji Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in says he hopes to upgrade South Korea's relations with Saudi Arabia by strategically promoting the Arab country's Vision 2030 as a partner. In a meeting today in Seoul with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the Korean leader proposed that the two sides work to establish stronger ties with each other. Vision 2030 is one of the Crown Prince's economic reform plans aimed at diversifying Saudi Arabia's economy, including sectors related to culture and creativity. The president said he hopes relations between the two will grow stronger, to which the Crown Prince said he hopes to see stronger economic ties between their firms. At the G20, President Moon had been hoping for one-on-one -on -one talks with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, possibly to talk about the two countries' dispute over Japan's use of Koreans for forced labor during wartime. But it looks like there will be no such meeting after all. Park Hee-jun has more. President Moon Jae-in's packed schedule for the G20 summit in Osaka has an unwanted gap, a gap that was supposed to be filled by a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. According to a senior Blue House official, South Korea proposed holding bilateral talks but heard nothing back from Japan. Bilateral relations have deteriorated sharply since Seoul's Supreme Court ordered Japanese companies last year to compensate Korean victims of forced labor during Japan's colonial rule. Japan has repeatedly called for an arbitration panel involving a third party to which South Korea is yet to respond. 
South Korea has also recently proposed settling the wartime labor dispute for a joint fund between companies from both countries to compensate the Korean victims. But this was also rejected by Japan. Observers have speculated that this is a reason Abe has decided not to arrange the talks. But this leader-to-leader -leader meeting was seen as the best chance the two sides had to narrow their differences on the issue. With diplomacy moving with the Blue House at the center and with all authority given to President Moon, the president needs to be the one solving this issue. We can't say that the top-down approach is the best way, but this situation can no longer be resolved at the working level. The leaders have to meet and solve it. Observers say that the government could seek to hold a summit after Japan's upper house election on July 21st. This is out of the belief that Prime Minister Abe is unable to be flexible ahead of the election when it comes to the sensitive political issue of South Korea-Japan relations. But the senior official also says the possibility of a one-on-one -on -one in Osaka cannot be ruled out completely. If Japan requests to meet on the spot, the official says that the top office will accept. But seeing that sufficient time and preparations are needed for the meeting to provide a tangible answer to the strained South Korea-Japan relations, the anticipated breakthrough could be unlikely even if an informal meeting does take place. Park Kijun, Arirang News. The World Food Program has assessed North Korea's food shortages and concluded that so-called hidden hunger and deficiencies in micronutrients are the real crisis. James Belgrave, one of the WFP's uh, officers that visited the North last month for an on-site assessment, wrote on the UN agency's website that the diets of North Koreans are largely limited to rice and kimchi or eggs, far from balanced and nutritious. He said what mothers and children eat during the first 1,000 days from conception to the child's second birthday has a lifelong impact on a child's growth, but mothers struggle every day to find enough food. Belgrave said that regardless of the geopolitical situation, humanitarian work in the North should be allowed to go ahead unimpeded. South Korea is gearing up to host its largest annual sports competition, the National Sports Festival, which will take place in October in its 100th edition. The Seoul Metropolitan Government says this year's event will see some 30,000 athletes compete at dozens of venues in the capital for a week. To celebrate the festival's 100th anniversary, a torch relay will take place throughout the nation, starting from places including Dokdo Island and the truce village of Panmunjom. In a first for the event, the Bank of Korea will mint 10,000 commemorative coins. Monsoon season has arrived here in South Korea, coming later than usual. Heavy rain is spreading across the nation today, so take your umbrella if you're planning to go outside. Kim Yo sun reports. The heat advisory issued for Seoul and other inland regions on Tuesday will not last long, as this summer's monsoon season begins Wednesday. Bringing rain to Jeju first, the monsoonal front is moving in a northerly direction. It's expected to drop heavy rain on Korea's central region beginning Wednesday evening. Forecasters say this year's monsoon season is starting a week later than usual. It's also the first time in 12 years for the monsoon to hit Jeju, the southern coast and the central region on the same day. With the monsoonal front traveling north, it arrives in Jeju early Wednesday, the southern coast shortly after, and the central region by the evening. The downpours will end on Thursday night, beginning from the western coast. The monsoon front is expected to dump torrential rain of more than 20 millimeters per hour on some regions. The Korea Meteorological Administration says heavy rain of up to 80 millimeters is expected for Jeju, the southern coast, and near Chirisan Mountain. 10 to 40 millimeters is forecast for Seoul and other regions. Another monsoonal front is forecast to arrive this weekend, bringing heavy showers to parts of Korea's southern coast. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. In the latest move to revitalize the Korean economy, the government will invest over 60 billion U.S. dollars into the service sector. Our Kim Dami has the details. Calling the service sector a treasure chest for economic value and job creation, the government says it will invest some 60 billion U.S. dollars into the sector over the next five years. 
In Wednesday's economic meeting, Finance Minister Hong Nam Gi highlighted the potential of the service sector, which is twice as productive as the manufacturing sector when it comes to creating new jobs. For that, the government will take the lead in extending loans to the service sector by 2023. It will also boost service sector R&D by investing around $5 billion and providing tax incentives. The government also proposed detailed plans for the tourism and logistics sectors. To attract more foreign visitors, Hong announced a plan to host a K-pop festival in May and October every year. Hong also promised to increase the number of logistics centers, especially on unused land in and around Seoul, and invest $176 million in logistics R&D by 2027. He added that plans to introduce smart services that provide customized ICT solutions and logistics will further allow integration between the service and manufacturing sectors. Kim Dami, Arirang News. South Korea's terms of trade got worse in May for the 18th consecutive month as import prices surpassed export prices. The central bank says the terms of trade index for products, which measures the amount of imports a country can buy for each unit of exports, came to 90.76, down nearly 6 percent on year. The BOK attributed the drop to falling prices of electronics equipment and chemical products. Import prices also dropped slightly due to lower industrial goods imports, but fell by a lower margin than export prices. South Korea's consumer inflation has remained below 1 percent since January. On Tuesday, the governor of the nation's central bank suggested that this will likely continue. Low inflation might sound good for consumers, but it's not clear that they feel that way about the price they've been paying for things they buy every day. Our Go Jun-hee explains. Consumer prices edged up 0.7 percent on year last month in Korea, which is far lower than the central bank's 2 percent target. Statistics Korea attribute the sluggish inflation to low domestic demand and the government expanding welfare policies such as free education. Although consumer price growth in Korea has remained below 1 percent for five consecutive months, many say they haven't felt a trend in their everyday lives, especially here at supermarkets. This is mainly because prices of what consumers use and buy every day, such as fresh food and daily necessities, are rising. Data from Korea Consumer Agency, a government organization, shows that the average price of 30 frequently consumed processed foods has been going up in recent months. I feel like the price of everything has gone up. It's too expensive, especially the things I buy, like rice, anchovies and fruit. I only buy things that are really necessary. The price of alcohol has risen, including soju. The cost of drinking has become quite burdensome. And it's not just groceries. The average price of dining out has jumped as well. The average price of a roll of kimbap was slightly more than two U.S. dollars in April, which is an increase from last year's figure of $1.90. Kimchi jjigae with rice, another popular restaurant dish, increased to almost five and a half dollars. An expert in the field explained what the difference between real inflation and the inflation that people actually feel means for the economy. In a situation where consumers feel difficulties affording everyday purchases, but figures show prices aren't high, problems can occur when the government establishes economic policies. For instance, public utility charges can change depending on the consumer price index. While the government explains it's difficult to completely reduce the gap, saying different households have different expenditure structures, Experts say that the difference negatively affects how people feel about their quality of life. Kuruni, Arirang News. It's time now for an in-depth look at the global market action this afternoon. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Dr. Yang jun Sak, professor of economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Dr. Yang, thanks for coming on today. Happy to be here. So the U.S. and China are going to have their own summit during the G20 later this week. Uh, now there's talk of a U.S. court taking action that would really be crippling against Chinese banks as part of a case uh, with the North Korea sanctions. How's the market going to react if there are sanctions on these banks in China? Okay, well, the uh, bank under the question seems to be Shanghai Pudong Development Bank, so that's not, that has not been confirmed. It's the uh, ninth largest bank in uh, 
China, and uh, its r- assets are roughly $900 billion, which makes it comparable to uh, size to Goldman Sachs uh, in the U.S. Uh, the uh, SPDB, the uh, Shanghai Pudong Development Bank, has no U.S. branch, but it does maintain accounts in the U.S. to handle U.S. dollar transactions. And what the uh, court ruling basically says is that uh, if uh, the SPDB does not comply with U.S. requests to uh, provide information on the dealings that they had with uh, a friend company for the North Korea, uh, the Attorney General of the United States or Treasury Secretary of the United States can terminate the bank's U.S. account and ability to process U.S. dollar transactions. Now, if this was an international bank, uh, that would basically mean it's a death sentence for that uh, bank. But the SPDB, uh, because it does not have a lot of global presence, it might be able to survive uh, the uh, uh, the uh, U.S. order, but uh, the concern here is that because it is the ninth largest bank in China, Chinese government may deem it too big to fail, so uh, it may try to prop up the bank somehow, and also it may uh, reduce credibility, uh, it may reduce confidence in Chinese banking system, uh, which could blow into a major financial crisis in China, and if that spreads, it could go up to the financial crisis crisis uh, throughout the region or even globally. Uh, but the, uh, perhaps the uh, concern here is that uh, even though there is that large risk, a lot of uh, U.S. C- uh, congressmen as well as the Trump administration is looking at this measure seriously because they want a harsher crackdown on North Korea. Got it. That'll be an interesting dynamic there in, uh, in Osaka coming up. But uh, now looking at South Korea's exports for a minute, the U.S. has lowered its duties on Korean steel. Uh, the steelmaker POSCO had given up for a while, but it'll be looking presumably uh, to go back to uh, shipping to America. Is the Korean industry breathing a sigh of relief right now? Okay, well, uh, if you can get a bit more technical here, uh, there were two types of tariffs that were hit on POSCO and Hyundai Steel. Uh, first is anti-dumping, which uh, means that U.S. believed that the, uh, these companies were selling steel too cheaply in the U.S. And then there's countervailing tariffs, which means that the U.S. is putting on tariffs because they believe that Korean government was uh, giving unfair uh, subsidies to these companies. Now, the, uh, uh, the ruling by the U.S. basically raised the anti-dumping tariffs slightly, but reduced the countervailing tariffs greatly. So overall, the tariff burden on these two firms came down. Then that which should give uh, more room for these uh, two companies to export. Uh, there's an interesting aside here. There was an interesting case decided by the U.S. Court of Appeals on the 21st, uh, which basically pitted U.S. steel companies against Korean government and Korean steel companies. Uh, the uh, U.S. companies were claiming that Korean, com- uh, Korean government was giving subsidies to Korean, Korean steel companies through low electricity rates, uh, but the uh, U.S. court found that to be the wrong criteria to use. Uh, so that part may be part of the reason why the countervailing tariffs have been lowered not only for the uh, uh, Hyundai and POSCO, but also for uh, other Korean steel companies. Uh, But having said that, Korea is still subject to the steel tariffs that Korea and uh, Trump, President Trump negotiated. Uh, So uh, even though Hyundai and uh, POSCO are now going to be able to export more, it will still be limited by that tariff, uh, excuse me, by that quota, and that means competition among Korean companies rather than competition between Korean companies and foreign companies. Well, in another U.S. issue, uh, the Korean government's asking the U.S. to get rid of the safeguards it put in place last year on washing machines from Korea, saying they're not hurting American industries. Now, Korea will be looking to win uh, at the WTO on this issue as well. What's going on here, and uh, how do you see it working out? Okay, well, the uh, 
washing machine safeguard is not even popular in the United States. Uh, the uh, recent study that came out in April uh, says that the uh, after the uh, safeguard on Korean washing machines, the uh, washing machine prices in uh, U.S. rose by 12 percent, and interestingly, the dryer prices went up by 12 percent as well. And the study basically concludes that uh, there's not enough competition in the uh, U.S. washing machine industry, uh, and that's why the prices are going up. Uh, and it's the consumers who are paying for this. Uh, the the uh, cost for the uh, U.S. consumers have been estimated to be $1.5 billion. Uh, but the job creation due to the safeguard in the United States has only been about 1,600 jobs. So it comes down to about $800,000 per job created per year. And that's a really silly way to uh, create jobs. Uh, and even worse, uh, last year, the uh, company that headed the uh, attempt to uh, put stu- uh, safeguard on Korean washing machines, Whirlpool, uh, did not make a profit, though they may be doing better this year. Uh, what Samsung and LG kept their market share as and kept their uh, positioning as the largest washing machine sellers in the uh, United States. So it's really questionable whether the washing machine safeguard did any good at all. Now, having said that, though, it really comes down to what President Trump wants. If he wants to maintain the safeguard, then he'll probably maintain the safeguard. Uh, Even if Korea takes the case to the WTO, it's going to take at least 18 months, probably closer to two two years, uh, to get the case through the WTO. So even if Korea wins, uh, President Trump has the option of maintaining the uh, safeguard for another two years. That's if he decides to even follow the WTO ruling at the end if Korea wins. All right, very informative, Dr. Young. We're going to leave it there, though. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump will be sitting down soon with his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, when they're at the G20 this Saturday. Of course, they'll be talking about their country's bitter trade war. Most agree that a deal is unlikely there, but the talks at least could get back on track. Yi Min Sun reports. Ahead of the scheduled summit between the U.S. and China at the G20 summit in Japan this week, a high-ranking U.S. official has revealed the goal is to resume trade talks that have been stalled since May. According to Reuters, the U.S. thinks the Osaka meeting is a prime opportunity to get trade talks with China back on track. Chinese Foreign Ministry also said Beijing and Washington's trade negotiators have talked over the phone and the two sides are working closely under their leaders' instructions. This comes after it was confirmed Tuesday that U.S. President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping will hold their summit on Saturday. High-level trade talks in Washington in mid-May ended without agreement and there have been no follow-up negotiations since then. Instead, Washington increased its 10 percent tariffs to 25 percent on 250 billion U.S. dollars of Chinese goods imported to the United States. In retaliation, China imposed its own 25 percent tariffs on 60 billion dollars of U.S. goods. Even if the two leaders agreed to resume trade talks, the main concern is whether the U.S. will impose additional tariffs on $325 billion worth of Chinese goods, as President Trump has repeatedly threatened to do. The U.S. official emphasized that Washington will not accept any conditions on tariffs, but said they might agree not to impose additional tariffs as a show of goodwill. Im Min-sun, Arirang News. And the global shipping company FedEx has a special delivery for the U.S. government, a lawsuit. FedEx has been caught in the crossfire between the U.S. and the Chinese firm Huawei. And it's suing the Commerce Department for having to enforce its rules on trade. Hong Yu reports. FedEx announced Monday it is suing the U.S. Department of Commerce for requiring it to enforce export bans through extra screening efforts. This comes after a dispute over diverted shipments that prevented a Huawei package from being delivered to the U.S. and being mistakenly returned to China. FedEx claims its business is suffering due to changes to export rules designed to prevent those that the U.S. government considers a potential risk to national security from getting hold of key technology. Last month, the Commerce Department added Huawei to its entity list, 
preventing transfers of technology to the Chinese telecoms giant without a special license. And then came China's investigations into FedEx over misdelivered Huawei packages, to which FedEx apologized on Sunday, saying it was an operational error. Earlier this month, FedEx said its relationship with its Chinese customers is important and it will fully cooperate with any regulatory investigations. The delivery company says the rules assume FedEx can screen the millions of packages shipped daily, something it says is virtually impossible. On top of that, with 1,100 entities on the list, FedEx is at risk of being fined by Chinese firms for not delivering packages and at risk of possibly violating U.S. rules by shipping goods to enlisted entities. The U.S. Commerce Department said Tuesday that it hasn't yet reviewed the complaint, but that it looks forward to defending its role in protecting U.S. national security. Hong Yu, Arirang News. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for being with us. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.